Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining TIFF, for watching of films and for be part of these uh, virtual screenings. My name is Diana Cadavid and I'm one of the programmers here at the festival. And it is a great honor for me to have with us today, Alexander Morato, who's the director of Seven Prisoners. Alex, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and it's great to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you too. Well, you know, like, so uh, people just finished watching uh, Seven Prisoners, and I wanted to start a conversation by asking you, how are you feeling about finishing the film? How do you feel the story came to conclusion? Um, is it what you were uh, looking for, and what were you looking for in the first place? Well, of course, it's always really rewarding and humbling when you finish a film and you you project it on the big screen and you get to see the result of all those years of work. And, you know, for me, it's it, the films always turn out um, in many ways differently than how I imagined them um, at first, but that's part of my process. I kind of like to let life take its course and I like to let the film come alive on the set and so I always know that what I had in my head as I wrote the script I know it's going to evolve because you're bringing in collaborators and everyone's contributing something so in fact I think I would be disappointed if what I saw on the screen was what I had in my head I want to be surprised by it and uh, so how did you start working on the story? I mean, is, um, I think that what the, one of the things that you captured that I was like so surprised about and, uh, and moved by is um, the, du like the, the duality of the good and the bad and how it's very difficult to define good and bad because, you know, like life changes and, and we change as human beings. Um, how did you get to write the story? Why did you have an interest on it? Well, it's a very interesting question because when I first started thinking about the subject, it was so clear to me in my head who's good and who's bad in the story. But as I started to dive deeper into each of the characters, I, I started to ask myself more questions. Why would somebody enslave another person or traffic another person why would anyone do that and and then of course i started asking myself questions about how how are are crimes like this perpetuated over generations and and millennia even and so the deeper i dug the grayer the areas became and the less distinct the line between good and bad became and i started to realize that the whole thing like life it's just a very complex very complex systems and so that's that was one of the big surprises to me in in developing the project and writing the script was finding those nuances and uh, so how long was from the moment you conceived the story to like when you started working with the actors? And can you share a little bit like how's your like the, your process? Like you were with Rodrigo Santoro and Christian Maleiros. You had already worked with Christian in Socrates and they their performances are incredible. So congratulations on to them and, and to you for the direction. Um, but yeah, if you can share your process. Yeah. Yeah, I so from the the writing, I think the first thoughts about the, the project were in October 27 October, excuse me, October 28 was it 2017? My goodness. Yes, it was in October 2017. I was in post production for Socrates. I can't believe it's been that much time. And I saw a TV special in Brazil on um, uh, Globo News, and they were talking about modern day enslavement and human trafficking. And it was baffling to me when I saw that 
Uh, of course, we all know human trafficking exists, but it wasn't until I saw that hour long special and and about the journalists who were accompanying the, the raids and I could see that there were people in Brazil today uh, in some of these videos, they were literally chained. They had chains on their leg, on their feet. And, and it was shocking to me. And I couldn't get that image out of my mind. And so I started to think and to dig and to research and I can talk about research later because that's a question in of it, in and of itself. I have a very detailed research phase, but I, you know, I would say from the the first this first idea in October of 2017, uh, we started filming in February of uh, 2019. So a lot of time goes by with the researching and the writing, and then we filmed. Uh, uh, and then another year in post-production with the editing and, and everything. So I blink and now we're in what, August of 2018, uh, uh, 2021. So it'll be four years soon. In October, it will be four years. Long time. Great. Oh, I mean, like you can totally feel the process on it. Thank you. No, and I'm sorry, Diana. I, 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 I forgot to also mention you had asked about my process working with um, Rodrigo Santoro and Christian Malieros. And, you know, with um, Christian, he, he was in Socrates, my first feature, and that was his first role in a film. So I really got to uh, see him from the very beginning and, and work with him, you know, with Socrates. He had come from a theater background. So I remember we had worked a lot. I'd coached him on on some of the differences between theater and film. You know, a good actor can can easily come from theater and do film. They just have to have the right coaching. They have to understand that the nuances in film, everything has to be smaller on the facial expressions and everything's so subtle because the camera is like an X-ray; it sees everything. And so, but he caught on to that very quickly in Socrates. So. By the time, you know, then he had done a Netflix series, Sintonia in Brazil, a big hit. And so to, to then a couple years go by and now do this film with him, I got to see how much he grew and matured as an actor in, in just a couple of years. And then with Rodrigo Santoro, I mean, he's just a pro. And, and and an incredible artist and actor. And I've always, I mean, I grew up watching him work. You know, when I was first uh, watching films, uh, uh, um, you know, as a, as a, as a boy and, and as a young teenager, he was starting out in his career. And so I was watching him work and I always thought he, there was something very special about him. And I, I, and I also love his range as an actor. You know, he in uh, uh, playing Lady Di in the Hector Babenko film uh, *Karanjiru*, where he plays a, a trans uh, a sex worker in a um, prison. I mean, it, he's his range is just incredible. And, but I'd never seen him do something quite like Luca. And and I, the reason I wanted to offer him this role one because I always wanted to work with him, and two, I love to see actors try something new. And I thought, how special would it be if, if he would take this on? And, um, you know, with, with Rodrigo, you're working with a pro, so he's, he's coming very, very prepared. I mean, they, they both were, but, you know, with, with Rodrigo, you can tell it's just a person with years of experience. And, and I think there was a lot, too, that uh, Christian can, could learn from him and a lot that they could give to each other in their, their performances. So it's fascinating to see them work together. Yeah, that's fantastic. They definitely like work together very well and you can see uh, their characters transforming on screen. Um, it's very, very compelling. And how was it with the rest of the cast? Because it's such a heavy subject. Um, you know, like as I was watching the film, I was like thinking also about like, uh, like how difficult must have been to, you know, like on set, like being uh, performing like these characters and performing such a like heavy story. 
Um, can you tell us about like the 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 other members of the cast? Like how was the casting process, and also um, how was you know how did you handle the mood in the in the set when when making such a like heartbreaking film? Yes, well. You know, the casting process was very interesting and I was working with a phenomenal casting director in Brazil, Patricia Faria, who's done many films that, that we love and admire, like Ana Mulher's work. And she's just terrific. And, you know, with her, um, she, she's always looking for people who can bring something interesting, not just in their ability, but also in the way they walk and the way they carry their body. And so she was going out and seeing actors in the theater and in small sort of lesser known groups, acting groups. And, um, and she found uh, uh, them by just really going in and watching and digging and looking for people who had something unique in, in their body and in the way they speak and, and who could really be these boys from the rural countryside and so so with them you know that and and of course at the same time they are trained actors and and i love working with trained actors i feel they can contribute a lot but i also love working with non-professionals and and we had a couple of non-professionals there two um young bolivian men in the film one of them uh joseph he actually lived through a situation of human trafficking and and enslavement in Brazil in a sweatshop for six months when he immigrated to Sao Paulo and he had a very moving story. And for him, you know, I, I was afraid would this be too much for him to handle emotionally, but for him it was very cathartic and we still keep in touch, very nice guy. And, you know, for him, he felt it was very important for him to be a part of it because that's the thing when I was researching, I had the Uh, I was able to meet with people and talk to people who had actually lived through uh, modern day enslavement, who had lived through human trafficking. And, you know, um, of course they've gone through something very traumatic, but they all want, my experience in speaking with them is they all want awareness about this and, and they want to tell their story and, and hope that it can help other people Um, so I, f I find people who, who I've spoken to who've lived through human trafficking, trafficking to be, um, you know, very open about speaking about the experience, um, at least the ones I, I was able to speak with. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and in terms of like, um, like the visuals of the film, um, How do you work with like your cinematographer on framing? How do you approach like how you're going to frame and visually capture um, what you want to create? Yes, well, there was an evolution visually from this and and my first film uh, in, in that my first film, it was just mostly one actor walking around and we would follow him from the front or behind. And, and then if he's talking to someone, maybe do a little bit of coverage, but for the most part, it was just one or two people in, in a scene. And so we could film sometimes even with just um, fluid masters and no cutting. Although we did cut with this film, we're talking seven prisoners, Luca, um, uh, all of those different supporting roles, you know, the inspectors and, and the other human traffickers. So there was a lot of cast. And so that was a, a real learning experience for, for both me and my DP and just how would we keep the visual language that we like, um, which is, we want it to feel spontaneous. We want it to feel very, real and uh, um, natural. How do we keep that, but also how, and, and, and also cover all of these different characters. And, and the reality is um, we learned you know, very quickly, this was something that Ramin Barani told us very early on, you know, get, get, cover it, get a wide shot. So we would always start with a wide shot because it's very good to have that 
it helps punctuate the scene sometimes. So even if we never cut to it, it's good to just have it. And in the meantime, the cast is getting used to the scene and the blocking as you're doing that. And then we would go in and we would we would shoot as loosely as possible. So, you know, the, the camera's moving a lot, like we're here, but then somebody says something and we can pan over here and, and back. And then we just do variations of that. And my DP was is João Gabriel de Queiroz. He's very good at remembering in his various spontaneous movements who and what line he got or didn't got. And then he'll redo it on the next take and make sure he got it differently. Yeah, I think um, while watching the film, I felt very like trapped, you know, like you get that sense of being in um, an entrapment. Um, I think this well, is- Well, Diana, a before yeah. you go, I just wanted to speak to that. I think to the great work by um, William Valduga, my production designer helps that because he created that junkyard from the ground okay. up and he brought oh, everything okay. and he built it. And to make people, you know, to make them feel trapped, he worked with all sorts of things with barriers and creating barriers. And then he worked together with um, Joel, my DP, and, and the gaff for Jimas to create a lighting design that mm -hmm. would create that feeling of being trapped with the darker lights and, and the mixed temperatures. So, you know, the collaboration between the production designer and the DP goes very far to create that feeling of being trapped. Oh, great. And um, I think this is a film that's going to open such an important conversation. Um, what do you think, you know, like um, is going to happen in Brazil, when you show it, you know, like we all know what's going on in Brazil and like the hor like the such difficult situation right now. Um, I guess what what do you expect to happen when this conversation sort of like breaks over there? That's a good question, and I have to say that I I honestly haven't put that much thought into it. But now that you're asking, I, I would say. I don't see myself as a political filmmaker, although of course my films are dealing with topics that blend into politics, but I'm looking more at the human side of things. And my hope would be that, that, that even more so than what is the conversation going to be, I hope that it just gets the conversation started because I think it's so important. And I think we haven't been talking about it enough in a, any country and and for me i've seen the great work that the journalists who who inspired me to make this film have been doing i i was able to speak with some of them and many of them have dedicated their careers to covering human trafficking and modern day enslavement but i think in the more popular discourse that topic isn't really being talked about as much so i would hope that by seeing the film people will start thinking about it more and and realizing how how much it how much we're all sadly implicated in this even if we don't know it um just by the the nature of uh how how we live and and now with covid i think some of this has gotten even more um clear just how how our labor systems are dependent on low cost and in the case of this film and millions of people in the world, just free coerced labor. Thank you so much for your time, for the film, for being with us. We have to go, uh, we run out of time, um, but thank you for uh, your candidness. Thank you, Diana, it's so good to see you. So happy to be here. Thanks for thank everyone seeing, for seeing the film. Thank you.